Welcome to the uh, Welcome. Please find a seat. After the award was approved by the Senate and Cabinet, we formed another committee chaired by me and uh, made up of Chris Livingston, Teresita Oberden, Madi Elisani, Thomas Wallace, Sarah Hendrick, Dayan uh, Saini, and uh, Emerson Case. We reviewed the applications and selected the inductees. I'd also like to thank Eileen Montoya for help getting the food here and all of that, which was a big job. <laughs> so, um, but really who really made this possible was were all the nom nominators who nominated so many people. We had a lot of people to, to select from. And uh, I just want to remind you, this is the first time we've done this. And like, uh, you know, we're, we're, this is like every first step we're learning as we move forward. So, uh, may not. But uh, we expect this event to evolve and grow, and uh, I'd just like uh, to give a round of applause to all the people who made this event possible. Um, you may be wondering why we decided that this was important. Um, as a library, we're concerned about the record that we have inherited from our predecessors and uh, how we'll preserve the memories of those who've made this place what it is. Uh, we're a community here at CSUB that's ever-changing, and uh, people who devote their professional lives and career to CSUB are replaced, and their memory needs to be preserved. Um, it should be with profound gratitude that we look back to those who built our programs and influenced the direction of our university. Um, our faculty touch thousands of lives over the course of their careers, and we need to remember the great teachers and thinkers who have influenced so many students that made this college built it. Um, only those professors who are fully separated from teaching are eligible for the faculty hall. Sadly, some of our best teachers are gone now, and uh, five of the six inductees today are going to be posthumous. Um, I think this drives home the importance of this event and commemoration. Inductees will be enshrined on the wall on the second floor of the library with a plaque and photograph, as well as a permanent biography on our website, uh, which Chris Livingston right there is working on. And um, we will, uh, we hope that you'll come back and see the exhibit once the plaques arrive and the final touches to the uh, exhibit area are completed. So before we begin this ceremony, I suggest that we all get some food. And once, we have, uh, and once we've been seated, Provost Zorn will give a short talk and then we'll begin the induction. So, uh, so please help yourself to lunch. I'll tell you who, uh, who to thank for this, in addition to Eileen Marquette, I didn't mention that the person who's paying for this lunch is going to be our keynote speaker. So um, thank you, Jenny. For <laughs> for funding this, and uh, <laughs> so I'd like to introduce our provost, uh, Jenny Zorn. Well, it 
I just have to say that when Kurt first was talking to me about the concept of this and what we hoped um, that it would be and how we could establish it as a tradition, uh, seeing today the number of people that are here, the inductees that, uh, that we are respecting today, uh, it really is a, a very good vision of, of what we talked about in that very first, that first time that he met with me. Um, so I'm very pleased to see what it is, to hear what the future uh, plans are, to have the photos on the wall, to be able to have access on the web to, um, to their histories and such. Uh, I think it's really going to be a very, uh, one of those uh, traditions that will be very important to the university and for the history and remembering uh, who really built the campus and where we are today. Um, I do want, as, as we start today, uh, I think most of you know that uh, one of the inductees, Gene Clark, just passed away last week. Uh, he, he did know that he was to receive this award, um, but I would like to, for us to just take a moment of silence in Jean's memory today. Thank you. Uh, I had a lunch with Jean about a month ago. He was uh, at uh, a group of the political science department uh, that he pulled together because he was uh, shepherding Charles McCall's uh, last wishes and his legacy. And so he met with the political science department and uh, invited me along as well. And it was, uh, it was a typical, uh, I think, setting uh, for Gene and what he, uh, he tried to achieve. It was very low key, it wasn't about Gene. It was about Charles McCall. There were some alum of Charles's that came and spoke from across the country that came and spoke to his legacy. And, you know, Gene really was recognizing uh, the fact that we have those faculty members who, some of them that are getting inducted are were here from day one. And uh, some of them in those early years. And Jean certainly is one that recognized that and wanted to honor them and their memory. And it was a very nice lunch. He, um, he gave me a gift in thanks for um, some work that I had done with the Sister Cities Project. And uh, that gift hangs on the entrance to my office on the wall there as you walk in. And uh, it, it means very much to me. Jean uh, was a generous person, and you'll hear more about him later. He was a, a generous person of mind to the students that spoke about him and how he mentored them uh, was very impressive. He's also very generous of heart. And uh, we all, I know most of you in this room knew Jean. So uh, it's a gift that I see in my office and I will remember him always. Well, I didn't know all of the nominees. I, got, I was fortunate to be able to know Jean. Uh, but they are legends. When I see their pictures flashing across here and uh, hearing the stories that I've heard over the, the past few years since I've been here, uh, they are amazing people. They are amazing people who have built this campus. And it makes us all proud to be able to say that we work here at CSUB. These are the folks that made this such a fabulous institution and a wonderful place to work and a wonderful place to have colleagues. So because of their work, we're honoring them today. And we really look forward to the other people that we can nominate and honor into the future. As Kurt said, the committee had many nominations. It was very difficult for them to select who should be inducted in this first class. 
So I, I do remind you next year, nominate people. If they were nominated this year, nominate them again. Uh, we have a number of outstanding people back historically from the campus that we need to make sure that we recognize um, as, as well as those that are more recently retired uh, from, from our ranks. So today, let's honor those people, let's thank them for their contributions and what they have done for this campus and so that it makes us proud to be CSUB. Thank you. Our first inductee is uh, Dr. Uh, Stanley Eugene Clark, known as Gene, and uh, Dr. Martinez will, uh, was a nominator and will be presenting the information about him. Thank you. Um, Provost Zorna was doing good until <laughs> your conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the introduction. Um, uh, so you guys know, uh, we knew that Gene was in ill health and did, um, we worked out that, uh, that I, we would come up first because uh, if we got up here, we were only going to have him here for about 15 minutes or 20 minutes, as you know, um, he didn't make it. So what I want to do is uh, introduce Gene's family, um, Camille, Car Camille Clark, you want to stand up, please? Alondra, Alondra Perry. Her husband, Kevin. Kevin Perry. Uh, and their daughters, Nicole and Melissa Perry. stories of Europe, being in Germany. And it was really interesting because uh, uh, I came here as a uh, scholar in comparative politics. And Gene at the time was teaching American politics, he was teaching judicial politics, he was teaching uh, pre-law, he was doing all these things. And, and it was, I was, I surprised myself and I think Gene surprised me because I didn't learn that Gene was a comparativist, that he did comparative politics and inter international relations uh, when he first got here in 1972. And that's just the way Gene was because over the years, Gene would simply take on all the classes that others didn't want to teach. And he evolved, and he evolved as a person, he evolved as a scholar. And one of the things that I learned was that um, when you're in a profession that serves, that means you just don't serve your clientele, you serve your colleagues. You work with your colleagues, um, you try to make the life you have around you um, not only as professional as uh, you can make it, but as make it as comfortable as you can for those who are in your professional environment. And uh, you know, one of the things, uh, talking with Tina over the last couple of days, Tina Giblin, Tina's back, where are you at, Tina? Are you still here? Okay, raise your hand. One of the things to talk about Tina is that uh, Tina Giblin, who was an office manager for our office 20-something uh, years, I think, uh, Tina made it clear that, uh, that Gene was the type of person uh, who always listened. And not just listened, but he listened with his heart. And so rather than going through his long list of accomplishments, and you'll see these in the press releases, I mean, there are just too many things to list. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, one of the stories that stands out for me about Gene listening with his heart. Um, I think it was in the second and third year, and Gene, um, I brought a student to Gene and I said, look, I caught her cheating. It was my second or third year. I didn't uh, know what to do with the student. I had my ideas. And Gene said, well, what do you want to do? I told him. He said, okay. Well, the next thing I know, I see the student in Gene's office throughout the rest of that quarter 
next quarter, the next year. And one of the things I learned was that Gene uh, asked the student what was going on in their life. And he listened. And this is why I say Gene listened with his heart. Because that student graduated, and I don't know what happened to that student. I, I know that she didn't take another class with me. I think Gene got my message. <laughs> but what I learned from that was that, you know, you can treat people with decency, even when they've messed up. You should treat people with respect, because they're going through things in life that maybe we don't know about. And what I learned from that, uh, that episode with Gene is that, um, is that we should take our profession seriously, but we should take each other more seriously, and we should look into what's going on in our lives and uh, in the lives of others. And again, as far as I know, I think that student graduated, but I can imagine that Gene forever transformed her life. And so I want to end with just, uh, I know we only have Minutes, but I just want to say that at the end of the day, Gene represents, in my view, the best of our profession, and I think he represents the best of ourselves. And I think as far as the first group of people coming into uh, this CSU Beef Hall of Fame, I'm just proud that Gene's among this first group because looking at the group, and I see the one guy here, now Gus Garcia, um, this is a phenomenal group, and I'm, I'm just proud to be part of this process. Thank you.
strictness in which she taught her class and gave exams was only to prepare her students for the rigors of the CPA exam and life as an accountant. As I prepared to enter the last months of my undergraduate studies, Dr. Doucette became a mentor giving me advice and assistance as I entered the MBA program at CSUB. After graduating with my bachelor degree in accounting and my MBA degree, she remained someone who I turned to for advice on accounting and my career. She was a true blessing to the campus and those students who lives she who lives she touched. This is, um, I think, the statement from one of our uh, accounting students, and I believe, uh, and there are other accounting students can share with the same view. And as, uh, as a colleague, and as I know Dr. Doucette for about 10 years, and she is really a wonderful professor, and is a um, really um, great asset to our accounting program. And as the following are, uh, you know, a list of the, um, her accomplishments, and uh, I believe I cannot list all of her accomplishments. I can only, you know, the list of some. And in addition to her teaching awards at other universities, Dr. Sad was the first recipient of the Kern School Federal Credit Union Faculty Athlete Award. And uh, she was designated as a Catholic Institute for the study of ethics a faculty fellow in 1999. She has served on student research committees, served on scholarship committees, provided leadership and mentorship for honor societies. She worked closely with the local community to develop and implement supportive programs that prepare students for employment. For example, Dr. Doucette served as a University Accounting Association uh, this is a student organization, and she served as a University Accounting Association advisor for a long time. And she organized different events every year, including resume and meet the phone workshop, alumni social, and UA graduation luncheon. And she also accompanied the student to the field trip, including San Francisco field trip. And Dr. Mary Doucet served as the chair of the Department of Accounting and Finance from 2007 to 2015. And uh, her biggest contribution is during her terms as a department chair, Dr. Doucet, Mary Doucet changed the image of accounting program at the CSUB to the local community and also changed the relationship between the local community of accounting and the CSUB and the Department of Accounting and Finance. And she formed the Accounting Advisory Council. And the Accounting Advisory Council meets every semester and used to be twice a year on the quarter system to give feedback suggestion to our accounting program to improve our curriculum and all different aspects. And so more importantly, and the so local CPA firms began to actively recruit our accounting students. And when I attended different CPA events, call CPA events, I met the uh, CPA firms, the partners, and they keep telling me currently they are key players in their company are from CSUB, which we're all very proud of. And um, Dr. Doucette also actively involved in security community funding to support you know, the, um, UAA student organization events, also to support the scholarships and to um, support our accounting programs. And uh, in summary, I think Dr. Mary Doucette really profoundly influenced the lives of the, um, uh, her students and also our program. And we're very proud to um, have a uh, Mary Doucette as our um, professor in, at CSUB. Thank you. I don't think I saw any family uh, from Mary's. Uh, okay. Um, this is an award for, uh, this is the uh, 
Faculty Hall of Fame uh, certificate and uh, in addition I'll give a plaque on that soon. Our next uh, inductee is uh, Michael Flockman and um, the uh, nom nominator was uh, Anderson Chase. So Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> it's really my honor and privilege to be able to induct my friend, my colleague, a true Renaissance man named Michael Blockman into this inductory, introductory Hall of Fame class. Michael was a professor of English. He was the director of the Hawk Honors Program, and he served this school with distinction from September 1972 until his untimely death in August of 2013. He really was a Renaissance man, he was a smart guy. He managed to get a PhD in English literature from the University of Chicago, you slackers. <laughs> <laughs> and he came here in 1972, and as far as I can tell, he just basically never stopped working. He published over 20 books, including Beware the Cat, the first English novel, which is published by the prestigious Huntington Library Press, and The Prose Reader, essays for thinking, reading, and writing, which he wrote with his wife, Kim Flockman, who is here today with us. Kim, would you please stand? Let's acknowledge Kim. <laughs> Michael was also the father of Chris and Laura, and he didn't like to brag about them, but he kind of liked to brag about them, just a little bit. <laughs> the Prose Reader, by the way, was in its 10th edition at the time of Michael's death and literally is one of the best known and widely adopted textbooks of its kind, not just contemporarily, but really in the history of the United States. It's an incredible book. He's also the author of over 100, of over 100 articles in eminent journals across the world, including Shakespeare Quarterly, Studies in English Literature, Theater Journal, Medieval and Renaissance Studies, and Studies in Philology. As a teacher, he really was a Renaissance man. He taught an incredibly wide variety of courses, many of them focused on Shakespeare and Renaissance drama. As many of you know, we recently moved out of Faculty Towers. I don't have a whole lot of great memories of Faculty Towers, but one really fine memory is walking out of my office one day, and Michael was holding class, and the students were up on the balcony reading a Shakespeare play. He was that kind of a teacher. He also worked for many, many years in professional theater, serving as the dramaturge for over 80 productions at such prominent West Coast theaters as the Oregon Shakespearean Festival, the Hoya Playhouse, the Kern Shakespeare Festival, and the Utah Shakespeare Festival, where he served as the company dramaturge from 1986 until 2013. He was also the founder and director of Camp Shakespeare at the Utah Shakespeare Festival, which he ran personally from 1988 to his death. He also gave numerous presentations and workshops on Shakespeare. He was that kind of a guy. He had a little free time at the Ushaw Shakespeare Festival. Let's give a little seminar. He was really incredible. He was also, as many of you know, the founder and director of the Hawk Honors Program, a position which required him to be very active in recruiting students from local high schools, to select and schedule faculty to teach in the program, to chair the Honors Council, and to arrange social and educational events for the more than 300 students who were enrolled in the program. And you could tell he had a great connection with the students because they all just called him Flockman. <laughs> he was also responsible for securing financial support for the program. And he was the primary reason why CSUB received a $1 million grant from local philanthropist Helen Hawks, which really transformed the program and turned it into this stellar program that we have on campus today. In 1983, Michael was selected outstanding professor for the entire then 21 campus California State University system. In 1995, he was named U.S. Professor of the Year by the Carnegie Foundation and the Council for the Advancement of Support of Education in Washington, D.C. And in 1999, he was given a, given a $20,000 Wong Family Excellence Award for outstanding undergraduate teaching in the CSU system. And I actually have the original brochure with me today. <laughs> Michael received his award. It's very valuable, so I put it in bubble wrap. Other awards included the Phi Delta Theta Fraternity, 
National Distinguished Alumnus Award, the CSUB Faculty Research Award, and the CSUB Faculty Service Award in 2002. He was also a member of Phi Beta Kappa. His other passion, as many people know, was judo, a sport in which he was a fourth degree black belt, so I didn't mess with the guy. He was also an avid tennis player and served as a volunteer assistant coach for the women's tennis team for many years. At his memorial service, I think one of his students, Brian Citizen, put it best. He made me a better writer, a better thinker, a better researcher, a better actor, a better human being. His classes were always so vibrant, so full of energy and excitement. Anyone who ever had the joy and honor of taking a class from Dr. Blockman knows how much time and energy he put into his teaching. I learned lessons that have stayed with me for 20 years. In fact, I've kept every essay and paper I ever wrote in his classes, mostly because of the feedback he offered. Always supportive, most times constructive, and often brilliantly funny. Sadly, Michael passed away on August 8, 2013, so he isn't here to witness the event, but I'm pretty sure if he were here, he would have a sly, self-deprecating grin on his face and would be enjoying this immensely. So I'll just end on two notes. One, I think Michael would be very, very pleased to know that I borrowed a pen from Provost Zorn so I could modify my script, and then I completely ignored most of it. <laughs> and finally, well, I shouldn't say it makes me happy, but it makes me happy to think that Michael was actually at the Utah Shakespeare Festival, was actually running Camp Shakespeare at the time of his passing. So he ended his life doing what he did for the 30 years that he spent here, working with students and contributing to their lives. And so that's the way I was going to remember my friend. <laughs> Kim, could you come up, please? And any other members of uh, Michael's family who are here? had a profound impact on students and, and on the development of CSUB. Uh, Dr. Garcia Gus had a profound impact on the field of education, especially in this region, particularly on students, teachers, and educational administrators. Uh, his career at CSUB actually spent a total of 42 years. Uh, he began in the early days of the campus in uh, 1972, and he finished up with his regular retirement in 2009, and finished out his work in uh, 2014. Uh, he was gone for a short time in uh, the, the late 70s and 80s uh, as he left to uh, University of the Pacific uh, to go teach there. And there he headed up, uh, in addition to other duties, headed up a Title VII doctoral program which uh, received uh, national honors. But in addition to that, prior to all of his higher ed work, he actually was an elementary school teacher 
teaching from kindergarten to sixth graders uh, back in the 1960s. So his full career as a, as a, as a uh, devoted educator really spans 50 years. It's hard to tell you. He started when he was 12. But, uh, as I did. But anyway, that, that, so I'll just say then that, uh, that uh, and he, and in terms of, uh, of our, what was the School of Education, uh, talk about that some other day, but uh, in, in our School of Education, he served in the departments of, a, of a teacher education, uh, advanced educational studies, and then administration. He's had a, uh, been a special role in offering leadership and inspiration to local teachers, educational administrators, and serving especially the large population of English learners and bilingual children in, in the San Joaquin Valley. His professional uh, focus has always been on teaching as you would like to be taught. To, con to not convey just the content of the field, but to treat the student respectfully and to develop the whole person to assure that each of his students care about their students and about learning. Um, I, I don't want to get into a big long list of his accomplishments. Uh, I'll just briefly say that he, he headed up our multi-subject and bilingual credential programs. He was the director of uh, elementary education and student teaching, student teaching program. He brought to the campus over $3 million of federal grants that went to support students to attend CSUB and to support some special initiatives. Uh, I'll just say that when I uh, was completing the nomination, I let the word out to a few people that I knew that I was going to be uh, nominating Gus, and, and if anybody wanted to add on, let me know. And I we had a number of faculty who allowed me to add their names to the list of nominees, and then he began to receive letters from some of his former students who were saying, I understand Gus is being nominated for this award. We want to comment. So some of those students are actually here. Uh, Jamie Flores is the director of migrant education for our entire region. Uh, she's a former student of, of Gus. But uh, so students sent uh, comments, and I, you know, there was a, a half dozen letters or more that came in. I can't say, can't quote from all of them or anything. I'll just say that, that a, a couple of quotes, as uh, one student mentioned, that he, he empowered us to be strong leaders and learners. He paced the room like a, like a preacher, preaching higher ed and preaching education for all. I'll just put that on. Introduce Gus, one of my mentors, and uh, uh, many others. Shoulder students could go to Tanya Walker. <laughs> I'm serious about his covering all the bases, so I'm just going to try to cut through a few things. Most of the work that we did, we did as a team. You know, I was in the right place at the right time. Um, when I arrived on campus in '72, there was already a wonderful program going on, and it was the mini core program. And John Acosta was the director, he was at the helm. The John passed away a few years ago, but his legacy continues with the mini core program. I would be remiss not to mention him. At the time,
time that Dr. Kellenberger and I and other people were developing the, uh, the Moton Subjects Program for the first time, uh, John was there to work with me, along with the main Medicor, work with me to develop the bilingual emphasis, which we built into that original, original program. That became very important later on. We were also getting a lot of help from Bakeshaw College. Um, there was a man over there who has a legacy of his own. His name was Manuel Gonzalez, best cancer of BC ever had. He sends thousands of students, many students that probably would not have graduated from BC without his, his personal assistance. He, is the, he was the father, he passed away a few years ago, but he was the father of uh, Andre Gonzalez, who's becoming very well known locally. I was teaching and directing an elementary education for eight years when Dr. Wildman, Dr. Lewis Wildman, was uh, helpful in helping me to transfer to another department where I was able to work more in elementary, more in bilingual education. And there were just a number of people I want to mention that played an important role in each of those programs. One of them is Patricia Rice in the Kern County Superintendent of Schools Office. We jointly wrote that first federal grant. Dr. Debbie Hirai, who is emeritus now here, who is living in Nevada, uh, she worked with me to develop the CLAD and BCLAD certificate program. Nella Gonzalez, whose students could go to when they couldn't put up with me anymore. You know, they'd get a lot of help from her. <laughs> she was one of our teachers. Another person, who came here as a brand new faculty member was Dr. Frank Espinosa. He is a star up there in San Jose now at one of the community colleges up there. When he came, he was, he was a new guy on the block, but he knew an awful lot about technology, helped Tanya and helped me, and he helped me write that second grant, and that was the, the Becca grant, which brought undergrads to us. Dr. Lewis Wildman's assistance was always there. First of all, he encouraged and supported me in the preparation of the MA program, and then the third grant as well. These are people who carried the load, really were very helpful. Without them, it would not have been possible. Now, Dr. Martinez mentioned that some of uh, our former students are here, and I'd like to feel all your applause, but I do want them to be recognized. First one I want to mention, first of all, in John Acosta's program, the Minicore program, uh, well, I would say that virtually every graduate from the Mini Corps, from the, the Mini Corps program turned out to be an excellent educator. They're all over the place. El Capilla, for example, became assistant superintendent of Mexico City School District. Joe Capilla was an administrator in uh, Wasco. Refugio Martinez was a principal in Wasco. I could just go on and on. That we're doing. Frank Chavez, the one that everyone thought was going to fail. <laughs> ended up being superintendent of Richland, uh, Rich Grove School District. And then, my favorite one of all <laughs> is here, the inspiration, the one that kept everybody alive and going strong is here today, Jenny Flotis. Stand up, Jenny. <laughs> She may be short in stature. <laughs> she is short in stature, <laughs> but she's a giant. She is, as Tomas mentioned, she is director of migrant education for this entire region. Okay, out of Bakersfield City Schools right now. Law school girl, right? Secondly, I'd like to mention, first I came out of that project that, that I worked with Jess Nieto, who's also passed on. On, and that was the Mexica project. And that person was Martin Castro. Martin was a freshman or a sophomore over at BC at the time. He is now president of the Mexican American Opportunity Foundation in LA. Can't be here today because he's in Washington getting funding for that program. That's second. Third person, Mary Alice Sandoval Bernan. These are just representatives of all these people, of all of these people that came through. Mary Ellis on the Val Bernal entered the credential program the hard way, raising three sons 
and being told that she was a little bit too timid to be a teacher. Well, I want you to know that she's one of the best teachers in Lamont. Now, been there a long time, and she completed her master's here with two majors, early childhood and bilingual, and she's currently working on completing her doctorate at USC and still teaching in Lamont. Couldn't be here today because she's testing. Next person, next three people, all, uh, all of them from the Becca Project. We may stand for a second, Jane, would you please? <laughs> Maria Villarreal. Maria Villarreal is going to join me right now. Maria Villarreal, who uh, is, is a restorative specialist in Bakersfield City. Her sister, Hilda Wright, who's a Bakersfield City and as an instructional specialist. Carlos Arambula, who's a teacher in the Edison School District. Please stand, Carlos. And the last person I want to mention is one of the representatives of the MA project. I completed his MA. And I, and I could tell the whole story, should I? <laughs> He's one of the people that didn't finish right away. And every time I ran into him, home people, Target, whatever, I reminded him and he listened and here he is and his name is Pedro Garcia. Please stand. successful graduates as an educator dedicated to improving the lives of their students. Their entire professional careers are devoted to help each of those students to reach their full potential and become productive American citizens. Now let's give them a big hand. So I thank you for this award on behalf of these educators and the students that they serve. <sighs> Give me a second. <laughs> um, I had a lifelong dream to reach those kids that nobody else cared about. Through them, I feel that uh, that dream has been fulfilled. Thank you very much. University. He was very excited. He, we came from New York City. My daughter was merely three months old and we came here. My young son was born here and he devoted himself enthusiastically to the founding of this university. He was an outstanding teacher. I still meet people in the grocery store who come up to me and say, oh, you're Jacqueline Cagley. I had Charles as a teacher. I never forgot him. He was wonderful and I'd hear all these stories. He was a person who was so concerned about not only students, about every person he met. He listened, he respected every person, and he was admired by every person. He received a number of teaching awards, including the Outstanding Professor here at the university, the CSU Outstanding Professor, uh, and he loved teaching. I, the story I remember about his concern for students is told by our alumni trustee, John Nylon. John Nylon was a student here, and I guess he wasn't doing too well, and he had missed an exam in Charles's class. Charles, after the class was over, went to the dormitory and looked up John Nylon, and he said, get up, I'm going, you've got to come and take this test. And John never forgot that. He said he was concerned about him, and that inspired him to keep going as a student. He 
was also very instrumental in uh, helping a number of foreign students. Uh, he was, a, we were in the Philippines, he was a visiting Rockefeller professor in the Philippines. He spent a lot of time and effort helping those students to come to the United States to study. He also sponsored a number of international students and he did a number of study abroad tours with students, so he was very concerned about broadening their education. He was, in addition to being a teacher, of course, and a, a very fine researcher. He was the founder of the Library of Living Theology, which is one of the well-known books on all of the famous theologians, Reinhold Niebuhr, Paul Tillich, Rudolf Bultmann, and so on. And he published 10 books of his own and well over 100 articles. So he was an inspired scholar. But he was also a person very concerned, as probably you know, uh, about the ethical life of the community. He was a public philosopher, and for 10 years he ran a talk, I call it a talk show, but he got he conned a number of faculty who were scared to death of being on television to come on television for a talk show to talk about burning issues in the community. And so a number of faculty members here at the university participated in that program. He was very concerned about raising the consciousness of the community in terms of ethical and other kinds of issues. He also was a scholar teacher and he inspired his own family. His twin sons both have PhD. One is a PhD in political inner science, international relations, well known in the field. His other son has a PhD in psychology. Our daughter went to law school and is now legal counsel at the Wyoming Naval Base. And representing our family today is my son Stephen, who is an IT at the Kingdom of College. <laughs> I'm a double graduate of this university. He has a business degree and a computer science degree. So Charles promoted study, study abroad, he promoted ethics, he promoted teaching, he was concerned about people. And one of his most famous quotations is, inspired by love and guided by reason. And that's the kind of life he led. And I think he had a profound influence not only on this university, but the many, many students, I still hear from them, that he taught. And of course, he inspired our family to go into education. So thank you for honoring Charles, and I'm very pleased that he is being part of this. Jim Whitley, and he, he will be, uh, the, the nominator was Chris Grappendorf. So here she is. Good afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor today to be here to introduce Dr. Jim Whitley. Before I begin, I would like to welcome Dee Whitley, who is here today. Dee, if you could stand, please. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Whitley joined CSUB in 1971 as one of the founding members of the university on the faculty. Dr. Whitley laid the groundwork for the creation of the Physical Education Department by being involved in developing the curriculum, programs, and facilities to support the department. Dr. Whitley earned his degrees at the University of California, Berkeley, and published over 25 articles in professional journals, including Research Quarterly and the Journal of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. His research focused on individual differences in strength, speed, and reaction time as it related to movement, and he also spent considerable time in his research and educating the community about the importance of physical fitness and particularly cardiovascular endurance. Dr. Whitley had a passion for the sciences in the discipline, specifically exercise physiology. In collaboration with his friend and colleague in biology, Dr. Dwayne Bloom, he developed the first human performance laboratory for the department. The significant accomplice, this significant accomplishment allowed for laboratory courses to be added to the curriculum and also served as the initial space for faculty and student research in our discipline. Dr. Whitley was an outstanding profession, professor. Over the past year, uh, 
Dr. Whitley's wife, uh, Dee, gave me a lot of his professional materials, including his master's thesis, dissertation, the research article that he's written, many of them uh, articles that he had written for the Bakersfield Californian, materials from his R RTP files, a little bit of everything. So I've had a lot of time to go through uh, those materials. And I found a quote uh, from one of his colleagues that said, students regularly comment on Jim's professionalism in the classroom, his high expectations, and his supportive, relaxed style. He challenges students with difficult material and provides outstanding support for their academic and professional development. In addition to teaching a variety of courses in the curriculum, uh, when I was going through those materials and looking out his uh, resume, he also served in uh, several different administrative positions. He was Dean of the School of Education, Vice President for Academic Affairs, and even served as Athletic Director. He served on the Ernest Williams Scholarship Committee, which was a passion project of his, on the Athletic Advisory Committee, Budget, budget Planning Committee, and was named Outstanding Professor in uh, 1996 and 97. Uh, Dr. Whitley uh, was also very committed to service in the local community. He was involved in supporting local physical education programs. He wrote numerous articles for the Bakersfield Californian uh, about physical fitness, was a member of the American Heart Association, and served on the Kern County chapter of the California Association for Health, Physical Education, Recreation, and Dance. On a more personal note, and why I nominated Jim, was that Jim served on my uh, search committee and hired me to come to CSUB. Jim was the reason that I came here and took the position. His passion and determination to grow the program, his love for the sciences, made me realize that CSUB was the place for me. In my first years at CSUB, uh, when Jim was not traveling the world with his wife, he had hired me and then retired the first the semester when I got here in the corner. Uh, he was off traveling uh, with Dee. He coached football at Stockdale High, but I ran into him all over town. Anywhere I would go out trying to get involved, Jim was there, still being active in all the professional organizations. And he always wanted to know what was going on at CSUB. I will forever remember my last uh, conversation with Jim. In October 2015, we had just opened our new kinesiology labs, and I called Jim to invite him to come see the labs, because he had started them uh, originally here on campus, and I knew he would be very excited to see some of the new equipment that we have. Uh, Jim had just gotten home from having knee surgery, but just as I imagined he would be, he was thrilled that we had to develop the new labs, and indicated as soon as he could get up uh, and walk, he would be here. Unfortunately, uh, Jim's health had declined later that year and, and he passed away in January 2016. Although he never had a chance to see the labs, I know without a doubt he would have been excited and proud about that and the direction that the program has gone uh, and that he started. Jim's legacy and passion for exercise science will live on forever at CSUB, uh, beginning this year with the help of Dee and a lot of her family and friends we have um, established the Jim Whitley Scholarship Endowment, uh, and we'll begin awarding scholarships to kinesiology majors this year. We're very excited about that. So please uh, join me in honoring Dr. Jim Whitley uh, as the inaugural, one of the inaugural inductees into the Hall of Fame. Thank you.